Yeah, Ali Madat, and thank you for joining tonight's webinar entitled HR Insights for Professionals and Salary Employees, hosted by the Aga Khan Economic Planning Board in conjunction with the Ismaili Chamber of Commerce. My name is Zach Karim, and I will be your moderator for tonight's session. Before I introduce, introduce tonight's panelists, I would like to call upon Honorary Secretary Irshad Merali, National Aga Khan Economic Planning Board, to say a few words. On set, Irshad. Thank you, Zach. Yali Madad, everyone. And thank you all for joining the webinar on the topic of Human Resources Insights for Professionals, organized by the Aga Khan Economic Planning Board for USA. Due to the circumstances created by the COVID-19 crisis, the U.S. government has introduced a $2 trillion federal aid and stimulus package which will provide a number of benefits and programs we can lean on. However, we cannot assume that this help will automatically come to us in the mail. We have to actively engage in the process. We have to pick up the phone and talk to our landlords and bankers, asking them for delays in payments of rent and mortgages. If we are unemployed, then we have to apply for unemployment benefits. And if we are owners of small businesses, then we should apply for loans and grants that can support us during this period of crisis. The Economic Planning Board is conducting a series of webinars on two fronts. Our first set of webinars focus on specific themes that are designed to provide information about programs and benefits, cutting across all segments of the Jamaat that are available and specific guidance on how to access these benefits. Our second set of webinars are industry specific. Basically, they offer information and ideas on specific business sectors in which our Jamaat has a significant concentration and how to minimize the damage from COVID-19 on our businesses. All of these webinars will be recorded and available on the Smiley Chamber of Commerce website. Another important point that I want to draw your attention to is, we have been hearing about a lot of scams out there. Scammers are calling or emailing people offering help with government grants and asking for people's banking information and personal details. Please be very careful about giving your personal details to people you don't know. If you need any guidance or assistance, all you have to do is call the Access Helpline. The institutions have trained volunteers ready to help you and you should know that this helpline is for everyone in the Jamaat, including business owners, wage earners, and professionals with questions. Finally, if we stay united and connected, we will be able to push through this crisis and inshallah come out on the other side stronger and better. Thank you, and Yali Madad. Over to you, Zach. Thank you, Ansek Irshad, for sharing your words of hope and for the EPB's institutional support for anyone in our Jamaat needing assistance. Now let's begin with our session on HR Insights. As a reminder, the link to tonight's webinar recording and Economic Resources Guide, the ERG, will be made available by mail within the next 24 to 48 hours. And finally, if you have any questions after the webinar, please call the Access Helpline at 1-844-552-2237. Our agenda tonight includes various components, including understanding the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, understanding unemployment, and a deeper dive on what we, as professionals, should be thinking about as we come out of this pandemic. Undoubtedly, these past few weeks, we have seen events and situations which we have never seen before. We are in uncharted waters and all of us are constantly being bombarded with information. Information that we may, we may or may not understand, how it impacts our lives, 
our businesses, and our careers. Tonight, I have with me an outstanding panel of speakers, and collectively, we will work to bring some clarity. Let's jump right in. Samir Karim, you are an employment attorney and work with multiple public companies as well as private businesses of all sizes. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act went into effect yesterday, April 1st. What does this act require? Thanks, Zach. I appreciate the opportunity to help educate those attending on these issues. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or the FFCRA, is the first time that our federal government has ever required private employers with less than 500 employees to provide paid leave benefits under any circumstance. While this is a great benefit for employees, <clears throat> for those that have the smaller businesses that are obligated to now provide this benefit, it creates some obstacles. This is especially true considering the fact that these small businesses didn't get much notice or opportunity to plan. This law passed within the last few weeks. It became effective yesterday, April 1st, like you mentioned, and now it is effective through December 31st, 2020. I want to say it's important to understand that this law is quickly developing. Every day, every other day, the Department of Labor is providing new and additional guidance. That means if you've read something that sounds a little different from what you hear today, or if you've attended prior webinars, uh, it's important to know that the information you're getting right now is the most current and the most accurate. So Samir, I understand there are two primary aspects to the Family First Coronavirus Act that impact the employer-employee relationship. Let's first talk about the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Can you tell us about it? Sure. So again, these benefits are available to employees of uh, businesses with less than 500 employees. So the threshold inquiry for, always has to be who is eligible. With respect to the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, all W-2 employees are eligible. There is not a time period for which you have to be employed before you get the benefit. I think the next question that follows is what exactly is the benefit? The benefit is a two-week benefit where for full-time employees, that's equivalent to 80 hours, or part-time employees, it's your average hours worked in a week over the last six months where you get paid uh, if you qualify under the reasons we've got outlined. So the qualifying reasons, uh, if an employee cannot work or telework and you fall into one of the categories that we have here, then you'd be eligible for this benefit. So I think the easiest way to explain the qualifying reasons is to separate them out, like I said, into three separate categories or buckets. So let's talk about the first one, uh, reasons for self-care. So if you cannot work or telework because as an employee, you're subject to a state, local, or federal quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. Or two, you as an employee have been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to COVID-19. Or three, you as an employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and are seeking a medical diagnosis, then you would be eligible for this benefit. So the question that follows is, what is the benefit? What do I get? How much can I get paid during this two-week period? So if you're taking leave for reasons of self-care, the reasons one, two, and three outlined above, you as an employee are entitled to 100% of your regular rate of pay capped at $511 per day. So if you make more than $511 per day, you'd be capped at $511. And if you make less, you get your actual salary, you would not get a windfall. So that's the first category or the first bucket uh, of qualifying reasons for self-care. The other two buckets, the first is caring for others. So if you as an employee uh, cannot go to work and cannot telework because you're caring for an individual who is subject to a government quarantine or isolation order, or has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, or if you fall into the school closure bucket, you are an employee and you cannot work because you're caring for a child because a child's school or place of care has been closed, or the child care provider of your child, son or daughter is unavailable due to reasons to, of COVID-19, <clears throat> you would be entitled then to two thirds of your regular rate capped at $200 per day or a max of $2,000. So again, if your qualifying reason for why you cannot work is for self-care, reasons one through three, you're entitled to 100% of your pay up to $511 per day. And if you cannot work or telework because you're caring for someone else, 
or you're taking care of your child because their school is closed, then you're entitled to two-thirds of your salary capped at $200 per day. So, Samir, we were getting a question around sort of the self-care. Does the employee have to test positive for COVID-19, or does a presumptive yes fall under the fact? So, I think it's a little broader than that. Uh, if you've been advised by a healthcare provider to quarantine, that could be for reasons because uh, there's a presumptive yes, you've tested positive, or you're immunocompromised and you're at high risk for harm from COVID-19, then that would be enough. Or if you're experiencing symptoms and you're trying to get a medical diagnosis, we know there's a, uh, there's a lot of push and concern over the availability of tests, uh, those reasons alone would be sufficient. Great, thank you. That really um, summarizes it nicely. Let's now turn our focus and attention to the second major aspect of the FSCRA, the expansion of the Me Family and Medical Leave Act, or uh, FMLA. What can you tell us about that? Sure. So, like you said, the second component of the FFCRA is the expansion of what we all typically know in corporate America as the Family and Medical Leave Act, or the FMLA. So, the threshold question again, uh, how do I qualify for this benefit? This benefit is available to all employees that have been employed by their employer for 30 calendar days. So, in the typical FMLA context, you have to be an employee for a year. Uh, with respect to this specific benefit and this reason, uh, you only have to be employed for 30 days. Now, with the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act that we spoke about before, there were a series of qualifying reasons. Under the FMLA expansion, there's only one reason for this benefit, and that is the school closure reason we spoke about moments ago. So if you as an employee, your child who's under 18, if their school is closed, or other place of care is closed, or child care provider is not available, then you would qualify. So if you satisfy the qualifying reason, the benefit available to you is a maximum leave of 12 weeks. So while with the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, those benefits were for two weeks, this is a 12-week benefit. Now in terms of compensation, the first 10 days of this 12-week period, so the first two weeks, are unpaid. However, if you as an employee have accrued sick pay or PTO or vacation, you can use that to supplement uh, to get paid during this two-week period. Likewise, uh, the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, if you recall, gives you a two-week benefit in the event that you fall within the child care bucket. So for the two-week unpaid period under the FMLA expansion, you can use the two-week paid benefit from the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, and so the entire 12-week period then would be paid because after the first two weeks, the following 10 weeks are paid at two-thirds the employee's regular rate, capped at $200 per day. So let's say you don't have PTO or vacation. If you combine the benefits under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and the expansion of the FMLA, you as an employee for a 12-week period would be entitled to two-thirds of your salary capped at $200 per day. So that is a maximum benefit of $12,000. Thanks, Samira. I think a natural next question to follow is that if someone takes the leave under the Paid Sick Leave Act or expanded FMLA, will they have job protection when they return? Sure, that's obviously a really important question. The answer to this question is a little technical. So let's start with the most simple rule. If you take two-week leave under the Emergency Sick Leave Act for reasons of self-care, or reasons for caring for others, so the qualifying reasons you see above in blue and green, reasons one through four, you should have job protection to return to work at the end of that two-week period, so long as your company that you work for has not shut down for economic reasons. The reason, with respect to school closures, if your employer has more than 25 employees, the same is true. So if your employer has more than 25 employees and you take the two or 12 week period because your child's school is closed, you should have job protection when you return, assuming that business is still open. However, if your employer has less than 25 employees and you take leave for reasons of school closure, whether you take one week 
or 12 weeks. Your employer may refuse to restore you to the same or similar position if that position no longer exists due to economic or operating conditions. Now, while that's hard to hear, uh, there is an affirmative obligation on employers that if they do not let this individual come back to work, they have to take affirmative steps the following year to try to put you back in a same or similar position. But if you, as an employee of a business that has less than 25 employees, are contemplating taking leave for school closure, you really have to think twice because there's a chance when you return, even if your employer's business is open, they could eliminate your position and then you would be left without a job. And then the recourse for you in that position would be to seek unemployment. We know there's been a lot of discussion about the hardship of these benefits um, and how they would create the hardship um, to small businesses. I know you mentioned the government is providing updates on this area almost every day. What is the current status of the small business exemption as of today? Sure, that's absolutely right. So when this law passed in mid-March, based on the language of the legislation, we thought that all businesses that had less than 50 employees would be exempt from providing any of these paid leave. What we know as of yesterday uh, from the Department of Labor is that that is not true. So even if you have less than 50 employees, with respect to reasons for self-care and reasons for caring for others, you absolutely have to provide the two-week paid leave benefit. However, if you are an employer with less than 50 employees and you have an employee that comes to take leave with respect to school closure, and if granting that leave would jeopardize your business, meaning your financial obligations would exceed your revenues, making it difficult for you to run your business, or the absence of the requesting employee would cause harm to the operations of the business, or the employer can't find sufficient workers, then that employer may be exempt from providing leave for the school closure qualifying reason. Now, what's challenging about that is, is that we know this exemption does exist, but the government has not provided us any guidance with respect to how do you apply for this? Is it a self-certification process? Do we have to get someone to sign off on us being able to do this? So as of today, uh, April 2nd, when this law is effective, you as a small business may think you should be exempt under the school closure qualifying reason, but you don't know how to take advantage of that. So I would say in that situation, trade carefully. And again, be mindful that every business, whether you have one employee or 50 employees or 499 employees, when it comes to the qualifying reasons related to self-care or care for others, there is no exemption. That is a benefit that employers have to provide. That's great. Thanks, Samir. I think that is one of the challenges for employees and employers because the situation continues to evolve daily. I think it is worth mentioning here that the ERG will continue to be updated and that the Department of Labor is regularly providing additional guidance and updates. Would you agree? Absolutely. The Department of Labor every day or every other day is providing new information, uh, answering new frequently asked questions. So. If you have questions or are looking for clarification, the Department of Labor is the best resource for you in addition to the ERG guide. That's great. Samir, I want to shift focus a bit and focus now on the employers. Having to pay for these benefits can really create a liquidity and cash problem for small businesses if they are, playing, if they are paying employees to be on paid leave and then still having to staff their businesses. How are employers supposed to pay for these benefits? So I think it's fair to say when you look through and read the FSCRA, the primary objective is to keep cash flowing to employees to keep our workforce having income. But at the same time, like you mentioned, this puts employers in a tough position. To offset that, as part of the FSCRA, the law says that an employer will be reimbursed 100% of the benefits they pay for paid sick leave or the expanded FMLA uh, as a credit against the employer's portion of Social Security payroll taxes they have to pay. So let's say in a month an employer pays out 50K in paid benefits under the laws we've talked about. And let's say their Social Security employer portion tax liability is 25K. Even with a 25K shortage, 
the first 25K would be wiped out because you have this benefit. And then with the $25,000 shortage, the IRS has said that they will provide you a check within two to three weeks to make up the difference. So while offering this benefit may put employers in a bit of a liquidity crunch on the front end, the government's trying to do what they can to make you whole by offsetting a portion of your tax liability, plus giving you cash if your tax liability isn't enough to make up and make you whole. That makes sense. It's a tough obligation for small businesses, but at least it sounds like the employer has some options. Samir, what about employees that work in businesses with more than 500 employees? What options do they have since the FFCRA does not apply to them? So Zach, that is one of the biggest disappointments and holes in this recently enacted legislation. It's interesting because our small businesses that likely have more of a cash trouble during these times are required to provide this benefit, but some of the largest companies in America are not required to do so. But with respect to the employees at these large businesses, in terms of their relief, if you are someone that is immunocompromised or at risk uh, or at serious risk, then I think the benefit you look at is asking for potentially a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's one option. But, or you could potentially take a sick leave under the FMLA. But the FMLA does not permit you to take leave because you're worried or concerned about exposure to COVID-19. The FMLA also does not let you take leave if your child's school is closed and you're stuck at home. So for employees that work for larger businesses, it really leaves you, unfortunately, in a compromised and stressful position. Now, there are some states that are trying to push through legislation to require larger businesses to be obligated by the same laws and regulations as the FFCRA. There is an ordinance pending in California, for example. But again, this is a fluid situation. So if you are in a situation where you are at a larger company, uh, you have some risk with respect to COVID-19, or you have kids at home, uh, pay attention to your local state laws, pay attention to what policies your company is pushing along, but otherwise, unfortunately, it does leave you in a bit of a compromised position. That's, that's really useful. Um, I have a question that's just come in and it says, I have an employee who wants to stay home to prevent the spread of the virus to his parents and his young kids. Could he be terminated? So that's an interesting question. Now, if you look at the qualifying reasons that we talked about before, being fearful of spreading the virus to family or those immunocompromised is not a basis to take paid sick leave. So being scared or fearful to come to work uh, does not entitle you to any protection unless there's a healthcare provider that's told the employee that they need to be subject to quarantine, or that employee is taking leave because they fall into care, for, they fall into the care for others bucket, and then they are taking care of someone that a doctor is told to self quarantine. But again, that is only a two week benefit. So if you have an employee that does not have notice from a healthcare provider to stay home, or the person they're caring for does not have notice to stay home, then potentially, yeah, they could be someone that does not have job protection under these laws because simply being, simply being fearful of contracting COVID-19 or spreading it uh, or uh, you know, spreading it to your family is not something that protects you uh, or gives you a qualifying reason to take advantage of these benefits. That's very good. Thank you for answering that question. This information has been very useful. Let's put it to action by reviewing some scenarios that have come to our attention over the past uh, few weeks. So this act went into effect yesterday. If my employer closes after today, can I still get paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave? So unfortunately for employees, the answer to this question is no. Uh, this is a benefit that's intended only for active employees that are working in an active business. So. <clears throat> Likewise, kind of related to your question, Zach, if you're actually taking this leave and it's been granted to you, and during that time your employer shuts their business, then your employer is no longer obligated to continue to pay you this benefit as well. So uh, kind of a general rule to think of is you have to be an active employee and you have to be 
an employee of an active business if you want to qualify for this benefit. That's great. Um, another scenario is if my employer is open but furloughs me. So we have heard that term probably in job-related discussions. What does that term mean? And if I am on furlough, can I take advantage of these paid sick leave and extended family uh, medical leave? So unfortunately, furlough is a term that we're hearing a lot lately. Uh, the term mm -hmm. itself means that you have not been laid off. Uh, you have not been terminated. Your employment is really just being put on hold with the hope that the economy and market will turn and you'll be able to come back to work. With respect to your question, if your employer is an active business but you have been furloughed, then you are not entitled to these benefits because you are not an active employee. So in that situation, your benefit would likely be unemployment. Excellent. Thank you, Samir. This is the perfect point to now talk about unemployment. Today it was reported that over 6.6 .6 million U.S. workers filed for their first week of unemployment benefits. Shamsa Pirani, talent manager and HR business partner at Parkland Hospital, joins us to discuss unemployment insurance. Hi, Shamsa. Hi, Zach. So Samir just spoke to us about furlough and helped us understand that it means employment on hold. In what other situations can one be eligible for unemployment insurance? So to answer your question, Zach, another eligibility reason for unemployment besides furlough, as Samir mentioned earlier, would be reduction in hours from what you are normally working. So if your hours of work have been reduced or you otherwise continue to work less than your normal full-time work week, you may be eligible for partial benefits. And the other reason would be actual termination or layoff through no fault of your own. Excellent, very interesting. So just to clarify, because I see a few questions coming through the, uh, through the discussion. If my hours have been cut due to COVID-19, can I file for unemployment insurance? Yes, absolutely. You can file and receive a partial unemployment payment to help you compensate for your reduced wages. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, what if someone has never filed for unemployment insurance? What's the process? So, Zach, unemployment is administered at a state level, so you must go to your state's unemployment site and file online. There are state-specific guides available on how to apply for unemployment on Auckland Economic Planning Board's webpage to walk you through the process. Please note that you don't have to separately file for the CARES Act, which is a federal funding signed into law last week. It is an add-on to your state employment, so there is really just one application. That's great. And when applying for unemployment insurance, what information is needed? So this is a very important question. The guide we keep referring to will also give you a list of all the items you will want to have available before you start your application. However, some items that are common in most states include last employer's business name and address, your start and end date, so that includes day, month, and year of employment, as well as your W-2 income or 1099 from previous and current year. Lastly, alien registration number if you are not a U.S. citizen. While green card holders are eligible to apply, we recommend that you seek advice from your immigration attorney to ensure that receiving unemployment benefits will not adversely impact you in future. That's great. And, and that's, I think, worth repeating, right? Because we've had uh, a few uh, questions come in through the chat around 1099 and green card. So can you just tell us again? Um, so 1099 is um, um, eligible for unemployment insurance. And again, green card is also available for unemployment insurance, correct? Absolutely. Due to this new law, yes, uh, 1099 uh, employees can apply for unemployment as well as if you're not a U.S. citizen but a green card holder, you're eligible for this insurance as well. Oh. Right. Now, given the number of applicants, how long do you think it will take to receive the unemployment benefits? So, Zach, after you have filed the unemployment claim, you should receive a response in about two weeks. And if you are approved, you can expect to receive a payment uh, about two to three weeks after that. So I would say about four to five weeks total. Right, right. Okay, good, good. And how much unemployment can one expect to receive? 
So this is a great question. Generally, individuals are paid half of their weekly wages based on earnings from the previous four quarters. However, there are caps on this and they vary by state. For example, the cap in Texas is, little, is a little over $500 a week. On an, so on an annual basis, that is about that is $25,000 a year. There are many professionals that make well over $1,000 per week. So please set your expectations around what unemployment will do for you. The CARES Act that was signed into law last week will provide extra funding to unemployment checks. The bill adds $600 per week from the federal government on top of whatever base amount a worker receives from the state. And this boosted payment will last for four months. What is important here to note is that unemployment payments are taxable and you have a choice to withhold taxes as you receive payments or you may file for your uh, taxes when you file your tax returns at the end of the year. Excellent, excellent. And there is also a possibility that option that one's application could be rejected, right? What is your advice if this happens? So that's correct, that there is an appeal process if you do get, if your uh, application is rejected. Um, you can, again, so there's an appeal process which varies from state to state. So you will need to visit your state's website to find out details on how to request an appeal. We should note here that the Federal Unemployment from CARES Act which adds the additional $600 a week is for those that qualify under the state rules. So unfortunately, if you uh, if your unemployment state unemployment is rejected, you will not be you will not qualify for the federal as well. That's great. So similar to the first portion of this webinar, we want to put this knowledge to test and let's explore some um, scenarios. Okay. So okay. as a gig work yeah as a gig worker freelancer or contractor. Can I, and I cannot, uh, I can no longer work due to the impact of the COVID-19. Can I claim unemployment insurance? Well, typically those that are self-employed or freelancers, gig workers or contractors cannot apply for unemployment. However, the CARES Act creates a new temporary pandemic unemployment assistance program through the end of this year to help people who lose work as a direct result of the public health emergency. Therefore, these people or people falling in these buckets are eligible. And this would also include um, rideshare drivers such as Uber or Lyft, is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. And then I see um, through the uh, chat line that there still continues to be questions around hours. So my hours have been reduced and my wages have been reduced. Can I file for unemployment? Yes, absolutely, you can apply for unemployment. Like I mentioned earlier, if you apply for unemployment and you are currently working but your hours are reduced, you will be eligible for partial, a partial of that unemployment benefit. Wonderful. Shamsa, thank you so much for helping us understand so much about un unemployment. One thing that was made clear today is that there is a cap on unemployment and these funds may not be enough for us to meet our obligations. Let's transition now to talk about other things that we might consider to keep cash flowing. I would like to introduce Humera Kassam to the conversation. Humera is an executive HR consultant. Humera, I have heard about 401k and IRA being made available due to this pandemic without penalty. Can you tell me more about this? Hi, Zach, thanks for having me. Um, you bring up a really great question. I know that for myself and many other professionals that have been contributing to our 401k since we have started our employment, the idea of pulling money out of our 401k is unfathomable. That being said, it is an option that's available to you right now in these unprecedented times. Um, and it might be something that you may want to consider. Again, I'll talk through some details here, but uh, we urge you to talk to your financial and your tax advisors as you are entering into these decisions. So first of all, if you want to take a withdrawal from your 401k, profit sharing, 403b, or IRA accounts, you are able to do that. Um, typically, one is not able to withdraw from your 401k until you are age 59 and a half, as the plan is meant for retirement. However, under the CARES Act, um, the plan does per permit participants 
um, under age 59 and a half to withdraw up to $100,000 from their account until December 31st of this year without incurring the 10% penalty that would typically be charged. So that's really important. Normally you would lose 10% of what you're withdrawing if you were to take that as a hardship. Remember, when you contributed to this 401k, you did so on a pre-tax basis. So the, you were always gonna be taxed at some point, but probably at a later time when your total income is lower. Um, since you are pulling it out now, that distribution is going to become taxable. However, although the distribution will be paid in a lump sum to you now, um, that lump sum may be spread for income recognition purposes over the next three years. So that's an added benefit. That's a really good added benefit. Um, like I said, if you are looking to do this, you should talk to your financial or your tax advisor. Yeah, that's a great option, Hamara. Thank you. What about loans against my 401k? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, I should clarify that uh, 401ks by plan design allow you to take a loan, whereas IRAs, for example, do not. So you will need to look mm -hmm. at what type of retirement plan you have before you consider any type of loan. Um, so participants under the CARES Act for this limited time may borrow from their account the lesser of $100,000 or 100% of their account balance. This is an increase. Typically that amount is $50,000 or 50% of their account balance that you can take a loan from. Um, there are some particulars about uh, how and, and why you need to take the loan. Um, what I request you to do is to talk to your plan administrator because every plan is designed just a little bit differently. If you don't know who your 401k plan administrator is, I would encourage you to speak to your human resources department. That's great. And then and currently, I mean, some people might have a current loan or a current outstanding loan against their 401k. What is uh, your advice or, or some guidance around that? Yeah, the CARES Act actually addresses those with mm -hmm. current 401k loans, which is fantastic. Your loan repayments are actually delayed for one year. Um, this is a great added benefit. Again, um, uh, Onsec Airshad spoke at the beginning about, you know, cash is king right now and being able to um, be active and in deferring payments. So this is a great um, way to defer cash if this is something that you need. Again, I keep reiterating, you should speak to a financial advisor or your tax advisor as they would better understand your entire financial situation and advise you. That's perfect. That's perfect. Very good information about 401k plans. Let's pivot now to focus on the employee. What if an employee is not laid off, but they feel that change is coming or may be coming? What can they do? So, Zach, I feel like the world is changing as we know it. There is no one that is not going to be affected by this pandemic in some way. Um, I think it's important that we not just sit and wait for our fate to be determined for us. I think it's very important to be proactive. Let me reiterate that. Be proactive. Um, if you feel that change may be coming in your employment status, you need to explore opportunities. You can explore opportunities within your company. You can explore opportunities outside of your company. Um, you need to make sure that your resume is up to date. If you need assistance with that, IPN has a service called IPN Connect, um, and this program actually helps you do formal one-on-one -on -one career coaching. If they help you review your resume and your LinkedIn profile and help you with interview prep, um, and there's information on the screen on how to actually get started with that process if that's something you're looking to do. That's really good advice. Now, if someone is still working, is there anything they can do to secure their job? Um, what is some advice that, uh, that maybe you can provide? Yeah, we're in really scary and unprecedented times, as we keep saying over and over. Um, some employers are trying to figure out how they survive, and they're having to make these tough employment decisions, while others are trying to adjust to the increased demand. Um, now more than ever, um, we as employees, we need to be focused. We need to be productive. We need to have a good attitude. 
We need to do good quality work. Uh, try to learn new things so that you can help others in other areas. I know that these things sound very minor, Zach. I know that they sound very routine. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, they are more important than they ever were before. Zach, I've been in HR for 24 years now, and I've worked for some major corporations. And unfortunately, I have sat on the side of the table where I am making decisions about who stays and who goes. And while employers will always look at an employee's knowledge, skills, abilities, past performance, overall experience, attitude, those are all things that they're going to look at when they're making that decision. But put yourself in the employer's shoes for just a second. If you have two employees and they are equivalent in their knowledge, skills, and abilities, but one employee has a fantastic attitude and is very proactive in wanting to learn, help others, and do more, and the second employee does just what they're asked to do, which one would you choose to keep? This mm -hmm. is simple advice, but very important advice. No, absolutely, and I think connected to that, in yesterday's webinar, you talked about um, taking some downtime and what to do with that downtime, you know, using that downtime to maybe upskill or reskill. Can you expand on this? Yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, I, I think what I'm generally speaking about is having a growth mindset, right? Um, a growth mindset is simply allowing ourselves the basic ability to the belief, right, that, that we can be developed and improved through hard work and dedication. So my advice is to be really purposeful about this act. You need to have a plan. You need to define what it is that you want to go after and how you're going to expand your knowledge. Um, it can be technical knowledge or it can be a soft skill. It can be as formal as taking a course online or it can be as informal as watching TED Talks or reading articles. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I want to point out here is that ICANN is actually offering uh, trainings just like this to allow people to either upskill or reskill. Uh, on the screen, you'll see some information about an Agile Scrum Master and Product Owner Master Certification Program. Um, again, if you're interested, there is information on the screen about how you can take advantage of it. That's, that's really good. And, and connected to this, I see a question coming through uh, from the audience. Has the Department of Labor um, identified any dollars or funds for retraining? Yeah, that's a I'll great question. I'll open that question. up to yourself. Yeah, I'll open up to yourself or Samir. Yeah. Yeah, that's a Go great ahead, question. I, yeah, I will tell you that um, I, I live in the state of Texas, and so that's what I am most knowledgeable about. I know that, for example, in the state of Texas, it's through the Texas Workforce Commission. Um, so that's the same place that you go to file for unemployment benefits. There is funding available and out there. I don't have the website handy, but if, you, if you're on the Texas Workforce Commission website or mm -hmm. your state's unemployment website, explore those opportunities and look and see what programs are available. I absolutely know those programs are available in Texas and there is funding and, and, and programs that you can go to for low cost or no cost. That's, that's great. Kamara, those are all really great ideas. I know we said that um, the Jamaat is not alone during this time. Can you please discuss some of the upcoming webinars and resources that are available um, through IPN? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, we just put a slide up on the screen as well that talks about some of these upcoming webinars. So IPN Money Matters webinar. Um, this is talking about personal budgeting and emergency funds, understanding savings and personal cash flow. Uh, these are things that while we might take for granted, at times like this, they're very, very important. So you see the dates and times available there. Um, a second webinar is Relational Health During Crisis. Um, again, uh, this is available to you in, in just a week or so. Um, and finally, Effective Job Search Strategy. I see through the Q&A how many people are asking about unemployment. And so uh, it behooves me to point this out to say that if, if you do find yourself in a position where you are ready to start looking for a new job, um, 
please consider this webinar as a resource for you to be able to do that. The other thing, Zach, that I would love to talk about is that you really do need to stay connected. It's hard to network at a time like this, right? We're all staying at home for the most part, where we're being advised to, and, and how, do you, how do you then network? Um, well, there are virtual ways to do that. And ICN has enabled um, two ways that are on this screen now. One is a weekly virtual meetup, and this happens every Sunday at the times that are on the screen. Uh, this virtual meetup allows you to virtually network with other people that are professionals that may be in the same situation you are. Another virtual session that's available to you is called the IPN Virtual Accountability Sessions. Um, and you'll see the dates and times that those sessions are available as well. Uh, you need to just follow IPN on the various social media accounts for the latest updates on those and other things that they'll be putting out there. Zach, should we open it up to some questions? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions from the the line here from participants. And uh, Shamsa, we've received a lot of questions around uh, green card holders, 1099. Can we please repeat that uh, information? Yes, sure. So um, because of the new act, what I mentioned was 1099 contractors or uh, they're eligible to apply for the unemployment benefit. And also as far as green card holders, if you're not a United, United States citizen, you, you can apply for unemployment. However, we are recommending and advising that you talk to your uh, immigrant attorney to make sure that it will not impact you in the long run. Correct, correct. And I think that's a really important um, point that we should stress is to please consult um, your attorney. Um, Immigration attorney. Right. Zach, may, well, I also can, say, Zach, may yeah, I also please. say on that point, there are many, many immigration attorneys that have offered their services a free consultation for the month of April. I think they recognize that there are many people that fall in this bucket, but all of these situations are individual. They are not something that we could talk about in a webinar because every person's situation is different. And the fact that immigration um, offices are, uh, immigration attorneys are offering these free services, I would encourage the Jamaat to take advantage. That's great. Thank you, Tamara. Um, I have one for Samir. Um, so uh, participant's mother's been furloughed and she's 68 years old. Can she take uh, early ret retirement or early retirement? Can she apply for a retirement benefit? Uh, so it would really depend on where you're applying for retirement benefits from. If you have a pension package through your employer, then that would be something that's based on uh, the employer's pension package. If you're speaking of retirement benefits to the government, like taking Social Security, then assuming they are past the age to take them, I believe you can take those benefits as early as 61, and then you get more benefits the longer you wait, and full benefits at 67, then yes, they should be able to take those benefits. And you could take those benefits uh, when you qualified past the age without regard to whether you're working or not. That's great, thank you. I have another question here, um, a lot around retroactive unemployment insurance applications. So um, someone has been let go maybe a week ago or two weeks ago. Uh, can they apply for uh, unemployment benefits retroactively? Shamsa? So yes, I'm um, sorry. So yes, they can apply for the benefits a uh, week or months later, however, uh, I think they have to show, if, if it was just a couple of weeks, I can understand, but if it's longer, I think they have to show a proof of uh, what they did during that period uh, while they were unemployed, how, you were, how they were seeking their um, earnings. Perfect, thank you. I have um, an interesting one here for you, Samir. 
Um, if a small business, uh, um, their landlord is uh, not giving them a break um, under under any of these acts, do, are there are they protected uh, as a small business protected um, to not pay rent? So typically, the terms of your lease would control. Uh, in reviewing a number of leases uh, over the last several weeks, I haven't found any leases that I've come across that have given the tenant an opportunity to abate rent under their leases. And so technically, they're still probably obligated. Uh, a lot of landlords, though, are willing to work with their tenants because at the end of the day, they don't want empty strip centers and empty office buildings. And so sure. it really comes down to a negotiation and everyone acting reasonably. But there is not much legal basis, at least reviewing what I have under Texas law, for a tenant to argue that they should receive some form of rent abatement, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Let's take one more question. I'm just going through them. Um, so again, just want to reiterate that uh, it's our recommendation that if you are under a green card or if you have any kind of visa that uh, you please um, speak to an attorney, um, an immigration attorney, um, and seek, or, and seek uh, advice uh, from an attorney. So I'm sure we can talk about these topics for hours. I want to take this opportunity to thank all our speakers tonight. Can each of you provide a one to two sentence um, that you want to uh, leave the participants with. Yeah, I'm happy to start, Zach. So with respect to our professionals, uh, just because your job is secure right now with the way things are going, uh, you don't know if that's going to be the case. Uh, we're obviously all hopeful. But in today's world, cash is king. And so for those of you that have mortgages, car payments, uh, a lot of lenders right now are willing to give you some deferment where it won't affect your credit. They'll let you skip a couple of payments and add it to the back end of your loans. So it's worth making those phone calls to try to do that. And then you should also just watch your spending and be careful. Uh, kind of the rule of thumb you always hear from financial advisors is that you should have three to six months worth of cash to cover you uh, for your you know, bills, expenses, and your, your necessary expenses. And so do what you can to to get to that point and take advantage of those opportunities by uh, thinking about some of the things Mayor talked about, taking advantage of calling your lenders, trying to get some deferment, and just do what you can to secure yourself even though you have your job now because we don't know how long this is going to last. We always hope for good things, but we should prepare accordingly. Great, Samira. Thank you. Shamsa? Thank you, Zach. Uh, I just want to say it's been a pleasure being here with all of you today. I just wanted to share, I know that we shared a lot of information with you, so please reach out to us if you need clarification and have questions. My advice for those of you who may have to file unemployment will be to please apply for this benefit as soon as you can. As these are busy times, therefore do not procrastinate. Please do it in a timely manner. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Shamsa. Kumara? So my advice is beyond the professional life. My advice is to approach the situation that we are all in today as positively, as op uh, opportunistically as you can. Um, I am a big believer that something positive comes out of every situation. And so I encourage you to think about uh, why you're going through this, whatever happens with your employment, what you can be doing to um, upskill yourself. You might start a whole new career that you never knew that you wanted to do. Uh, be positive in your professional life, be positive in your family life, um, and, and stay well and stay safe. Excellent. You know, if I can summarize the discussion, I think that um, uh, it's been a really good, uh, good discussion and a lot of useful information. One is that, you know, unemployment insurance is by state, and so definitely encourage everyone to look into um, the regulations and, uh, and the laws for your state around unemployment insurance. Um, please consult with an immigration lawyer before you apply for um, 
uh, unemployment insurance if you are on a green card. And, uh, and, and, you know, I think one of the key things is to stay up to date. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, information is changing on a daily basis. Um, please refer to the economic resource guide. Please reach out to the access line um, if, you, if you require uh, additional information and additional help. Um, to, to our panelists, your guidance and knowledge on these various HR updates have been very valuable, so thank you very much. To our listeners, please be reminded that a link to tonight's webinar recording and the economic resource guide will be mailed um, and available to you within the next 24 to 48 hours. And finally, if you have any questions after the webinar, please call the access line. And the number again is 1-844-552-2237. Please continue to stay informed and stay safe. Ya Thank you.